Hey everyone, my name is Timo, you're watching Timber Timo, and this episode is all about floor refinishing. I will walk you through my 12 step process of floor refinishing by showing you step by step how to refinish an old and beat up German oak parquet floor like this one. Refinishing floors is no rocket science, it's simply knowing and following a process. It's a lot of work and noise and dust and effort, but trust me, you can do it. I will promise you, you will be very satisfied in the end, because you will put in all that work and effort and you will have immediately a great reward by a fantastic looking floor afterwards, which is a very, very good and satisfying feeling. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get to work. Step number one. It's actually not a real step, but it's that important that I named it step number one anyways. And please trust me on this one. This step will decide if your project is going to be a success or a total failure before you even started it. And it's using the right tools. And here they are. A rotary sander for applying the finish and for finish sanding. An orbital sander or even better something like this Festool Rotex for spot sanding and the final edge sanding step. A drum or drum belt sander for the main surface, an edge sander to sand the edges and the shop wag to keep all the dust under control. I will put links to all those tools in the video description. Step number two is removing the baseboards. Some guys leave them on there, but I highly recommend getting them off because you will have a way more professional and cleaner result in the end. And you will also not going to damage them with your edge sander. And uh, here comes good advice. Once you put them off there, label them and you will have a much easier job putting them on later. Step number three. This is the first sanding step and we will be using a very rough grid for this step, like 36 or you could also take 40. It's important to understand that the purpose of this sanding step is removing material. You have to send all the old finish off now, you have to send all the dents out now, you have to send all the scratches out now and all the stains as well if there should be some. All the following sanding steps are only there to create a smoother and finer finish, but not for removing material. That's happening now. Let's call sanding the surface 3.1 and sanding the edges 3.2. Telling you everything in detail about how to operate a machine like this would fill a whole video, but in a nutshell, it's like this. Always sand in straight lines and in direction of the wood grain. Only sand while you are moving the machine. Move the machine at a constant speed to remove the same amount of material everywhere. To start sanding, move the machine forward and drop the belt gently on the floor. To stop sanding, lift the belt while the machine is still moving. This is important because you will otherwise leave ugly dips in the floor. In the beginning, most people find it easier to send only while the machine is moving forward. Once you feel a bit more confident, you can also send while moving the machine backwards. Let your sanding passes overlap a bit to make sure you have been sanding everywhere. In most cases, it's good enough to do this sanding step once, but this floor was so beat up that I have to repeat this sanding step because I didn't get all the dents and scratches out. There are still quite a few of them in there. And as you will remember, we have to get all of them out now in this st sanding step because we won't remove them later with the finer grids. Step 3.2 is sanding the edges with grid 36. The purpose of doing this is the same as in step 3.1 getting all the old finish off and getting all the dense scratches and stains out. Plus, we did take quite a bit of material off the main surface and we will have to get that on one level again now. 
And if you should have left some dips with the belt sander, now is the time to smooth them out again. Edge sanders are quite aggressive and have a high removal rate. Keep it constantly moving so you are not leaving furrows or burning marks. Edge sanding is hard on your back and your knees and you will most likely hate it, but you can't skip it. But you can reduce the effort to a minimum by changing your abrasives once they are worn out and running your belt sander as close to the edges as possible in sanding step 3.1. After you are done with this sanding step, go ahead and clean the whole surface off with a vacuum cleaner. It's important to do this because there are always some corns breaking out of the structure of your abrasive and those corns in grid 36, they are quite big and if you leave them lying around on your floor and run over them with one of the finer grids later, they can get caught up in this finer grid sandpaper and leave ugly marks on your floor. So. Clean everything off and you're on the safe side. Step 4 is watering the floor. You can use a towel or a rag or a sponge or whatever is available for you to do this. And apply about as much water to the floor as you would be cleaning it. But cleaning is not the purpose of doing this step. The purpose of doing this step is these three reasons. Reason number one for watering your floor is finding left over defects. So your floor might look pretty good right now after these first sanding steps, but uh, in most cases there are still some defects in. And once the water is on the floor, you can spot all these defects way, way better. So the water helps you finding all the defects. So take a pencil, no Sharpie or something like this. You will have to send all that out later again and mark out all those spots where you can still find scratches or dents or whatever. And mark them now because you won't be seeing them later once the wood is dry again. The water will raise the wood grain up and we can cut that grain off in the next sanding step. This will give us a better result in the end and will make sanding in the next step a bit easier. Reason number 3 for watering your floor. It will help us in the next sanding step because the wood will be changing its color slightly and you will see better where you already have been sanding and where not in the next sanding step. Step number 5 is spot sanding. In this step we are sanding out all the defects we did mark out while the floor was still wet. Use the orbital sander to do that. Use the finest grid we are going to use in the whole sanding process, which is grid 100. And send those defects out like this. We are using the finest grid because if we should be sanding in a bit deeper now than later with the big surface sander, we can be sure that this area is already sanded in the right grid and won't be visible later. Step 6 is the next sanding step and I will call sanding the main surface 6.1 and sanding the edges 6.2 again. Step 6.1 is basically the same as 3.1. It's also done with a big belt sander and in the same way just with a different grid. The purpose of this sanding step is sanding out the rough sanding structure from grid 36. It's basically the most important sanding step because you really have to sand out the rough structure from grid 36 now. You will not get that rough sanding structure out later with grid 100. It's just fine. So make sure you did sand everywhere. You will now understand why I said earlier that watering the floor will help us in the next sanding step. If you still have a hard time to see where you did sand already and where not, you can also take a pencil and make marks all over the floor. That's no joke, because once the pencil mark is gone, you can be sure that the rough sanding structure from sanding with 36 will also be gone. Another general tip is stagger your start and stop line. I did for example start and stop on this line with grid 36 and I'm starting and stopping on that line now. 
the reason for this is that you are, and especially as a beginner, removing more material on this line because your starts and stops are overlapping on this line. Means you could basically be sending twice that much here. And if you would do this on every sending step in the same line, this would get even worse and visible later. Step 6.2 is sending the edges with grid 80. The purpose of doing this is sending out the sending marks from sending the edges with grid 36 and sending out your start and stop points from sending the main surface with grid 60 in step 6.1. You already know the drill from sending step 3.2. But this time you need to be aware of one more thing. We have to keep this sending dust because we will need it to mix our filler in the next step. And it has to be only this sending dust from sending with grid 80 because all the dust we did produce before is significantly bigger than this one and we need this fine dust to mix the filler because only this is small enough to go in the cracks we have to fill. This means you have to empty out your dust bag of your edge sender before this step. Step number 7 is filling all the cracks. Fill all the cracks, it's just a small effort compared to all the hard work you are already putting into this floor renovation. Plus, the filler will help you to see in the next sanding step where you did already sand and where not. Use a good filler and make sure it's working with your finish. Take the fine sanding dust, mix and use it like the product tells you, use a stainless steel spatula to apply it, push it in all the cracks. If you should have cracks bigger than about 2 mm as I do, you should fill them with another kind of filler that is usually applied with a cock gun. If you have those big cracks, make sure you close them first. Once your filler is dried, which normally takes a couple of hours, you can continue with the next step. 8.1 is sanding the main surface with grid 100. The purpose of this step is sanding all the excess filler off and getting the sanding structure from sanding with grid 60 out. Try to use another start and stop line again than the times before. Depending on the room you are working in, the main access point, windows, direction of sunlight, glass doors, whatever. There are good and not so good points to place this line. In my situation there was no good line to choose. Placing it in front of one of those two glass doors would have been the worst thing to do and I placed it in between those two. Which is still not good but the best I could do. The sanding process itself is exactly the same than in sanding step 3.1 and 6.1. Step 8.2 is sanding the edges with grid 100. The purpose of this step is the same as in step 6.1 plus smoothing out the start and stop points from sanding with the belt sander. There is no better tool than the Festool Rotex for this sanding step. If you don't have one you can also use a powerful orbital sander, it will just take you a bit longer. If you have none of them you can also use the edge sander, but getting a good result will need some more skills. In step 9 to 11 we will put a finish on our already awesome looking floor. The purpose of putting a finish on your floor is basically for protecting it against things like water, dust, dirt, sand and whatever will come on your floor, but also to make it look even better. How you have to apply the finish will depend on the kind of finish you use and also on the product itself. You can in general choose between paint finish and an oil finish. I always prefer and recommend oil finish because they are better for the environment, they are better for you as being the person applying it and they give your floor a warmer and more saturated look. 
you can do spot repairs which you can't using a paint finish and you can still feel the wood when walking barefoot on your floor. I will put on an oil finish and the steps you have to take from now on will pretty much depend on the product you are using but there are some points which are in general always the same. The first thing is vacuuming your floor to get all the dust off. This cleaning step is also a good chance for a final inspection of your floor. I use this very good oil from Biofa. You can apply it with a roll, a brush, a rack or how I do it with a spatula. I use the spatula because it's the fastest and simplest way to apply the oil and I don't have to deal with used rolls or brushes or racks afterwards. But it takes some skills. There's a general thing about putting an oil finish on wood you have to be aware of. While applying the first coat of oil, you will always have this edge or border between where you already did apply the oil and where not. This border has to be constantly moving or you will get ugly looking stains in the shape of that border later. If I would for example let this sit for a minute or two, I would produce some sort of stain in the shape of this border that will be visible for the next couple of years. So keep that border always moving and don't let it sit in one area for too long. Some kinds of wood tend to do that more than others. Oak as I have it here does it, maple for example also and beech is even worse. You might find it helpful to create some kind of applying strategy before you put the first coat of finish on. After the first coat of oil was applied, I did let it sit for a couple of minutes and went over the whole floor with the rotary sander and the polishing pad. The purpose of doing that is getting the oil deeper in the wood grain. The oil and the wood are getting warm from the polishing which makes the oil and especially the wax in the oil more fluid, which really helps to get the oil deeper in the wood grain. You shouldn't have any excess oil on the floor once you're done with polishing. And the floor should also not be feeling wet at all after this. The finish has to dry now and letting it dry overnight will work in most cases. Step 10 is finish sanding. Let me again tell you about the purpose of doing this. After applying the first coat of oil, your floor will have a rougher surface than before. It will feel prickly or spiky. This is because as we did apply the oil on the floor, we did add moisture to the wood. Just like we did when watering the floor in step 5. And the grain of the wood did also rise up from that moisture in the oil, just like it did as we were watering the floor in step 5. That rosin grain is the reason why your floor is feeling prickly or spiky again now. And the actual purpose of this finish sanding step is cutting that rosin grain off. It really only takes a slight bit of sanding to get this done and the floor is feeling smooth again. In this very last sanding step you start by sanding the edges first. I use an orbital sander and grid 180 to do that. And I even crank down the speed a bit to make sure I'm not taking off too much of the finish and sanding on a lower speed also prevents from clocking your abrasive. This is sanding the edges in real time. After this comes sanding the main surface, which we will be sanding with the rotary sander. Use a pad like before for polishing the oil and put an abrasive with grid 180 under it. A net abrasive like this works the best but a normal one will also be doing the job. And again, it only takes a bit of sanding. I let you watch me do it in real speed to give you a feeling for how much sanding it really takes. Let your passes overlap by about 50%. You will get an even better result by sanding along the grain and not across the grain as I do it here. But the shape of the room kind of forced me to do it this way. 
a final cleaning and we are good for the 11th step which is applying the second and also last coat of finish. I'm using the exact same finish as before but I'm applying it a bit different. Do the edges first. You can use a cotton rag to rub just a bit of the oil around the edges. You really don't need a lot of this kind of oil because it has a very high amount of wax in it. You don't need to worry about the stain thing from the first finishing step because this is only relevant in the first finishing step on raw wood. To do the main surface we will be using the rotary sander or better said polisher in this case again. You can use the same kind of soft pad like before to work the oil into the wood grain. The best way of doing this is by putting a bit of oil directly on the floor and let the machine hop on it like this. And the machine will work the oil into the floor then. Again, you don't need much oil to get a good result. You know you are using too much oil once the polisher starts spilling out the oil again. All you need is a glossy looking surface. You don't need to care about that black thing down there, that's just my camera. But for those of you who care about things like that, I will put a link to it in the video description as well. You could for sure repeat this step, but you actually don't need to when using the right kind of oil. The twelfth and final step is putting the baseboards back on. Which I unfortunately can't show you because someone forgot to press record. But it's basically the same as taking them off, just the other way around. You will now realize how smart it was to label them as you have been taking them off. Or you will now realize how smart it would have been to label them if you didn't do it. And this is how the floor looked after the oil was dried and before I did put the baseboards back on. The floor looks like a new one and I'm very happy about how everything turned out. Especially when we consider how beat up this floor was before. Refinishing a floor like this one with about 25 square meters, which is about 270 square foot, takes me uh, one and a half days and it should take you two to three days if you're doing something like this the first time. The only thing I have left for you now are some encouraging words if you are considering doing a floor renovation on your own. You can do things like this. A floor renovation is uh, a hard thing to do and it's hard on your body and it takes a while but the good thing is afterwards you have immediately a great result and reward. So get behind it. Try your best, you will figure things out on the go and if you stick to my 12 step plan, you will have success and learn some new things. And even if you fail, that's also okay because then you learned even more and you won't ruin your whole floor, which means if you should fail and get stuck in the project, you can still hire a professional to finish your work. And in this case, you can then learn even more because you can ask that guy questions and he will tell you what went wrong, uh, how you, the way you did it. And then you can learn even more and more and more. And uh, the next time you might be able to do the whole thing on your own. So get started and you, you will be good in the end either way. Alright, that's it for today and I hope we will see us in the next episode of Timber Timo.